Praise the Lord. We rise up and pray before we begin the Bible study. You want to pray to commit yourself to the Lord tonight. That the word of God will reach out to your heart. You want to pray that your coming will not be in vain. That everything you hear, everything you learn will be of tremendous benefit in your life. Close your eyes and open your mouth and pray and talk to the Lord. The Lord wants us to live a life that is free from worry and anxiety. That you are not a bundle of worry. A bundle of anxiety. That you will always remember there is a God in heaven. And he cares for his own. And because he cares for his own... There is nothing to worry about. Pray that the Lord will help you. That you will not just be a spectator of the Bible study. Just following other people to come. But that your coming. Will be of tremendous benefit to you. Changing your life. Turning you around. That all these studies. Will meet you at the very point. Of challenging your life. That everything you learn will actually bring a definite change. Change in your reactions to the things that happen in your family. Change in your response to the things that come at you in your place of work. That you'll not just stuff your head with knowledge, but the word will inform your mind. Influence your life, change your heart, that the Lord will give you a sincere heart. Like Mary of old, you commit yourself to personal study. Of this word and the personal story will be revealed visible to all the people that really you have been at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have studied in his presence, and his study in the presence of the Lord has actually turned your life around and changed you. Pray that your neighbor will be able to see the light of the teaching. The power of the teaching in your life. And your life will influence them to want to come and study the word of God with you. The beauty of the study. The riches of the knowledge of the word will be seen in your life. Pray that the Bible study will exalt the Lord and honor the Lord. Open your eyes of understanding and reach your spiritual life. Make you calm, peaceful, resting in your soul. So you'll focus your attention, preparing for glory, preparing for heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do bless your name today. We do bless you because we know you're a loving God. You love us so much. You provided everything for spiritual need, a domestic family need, as well as a professional and uh, area of work. All needs in our lives are provided for. Lord, we pray as we come to study your word even tonight. You reach every life in Jesus' name. Speak to everyone at the point of their need. 
that there will be calmness in our soul, peace in our heart, the peace that passes understanding. There will be no worry, no anxiety. There will be no panic, there will be no fear. But we'll just follow after the way of the Lord, step after step, and day after day, with nothing to worry about. The calmness that was in the mind of Christ, in the heart of Christ, oh Lord, we pray you give to every one of your children in Jesus' name. All these anxieties and all the care, to lay them upon the Lord. Leave everything there. And then to walk through life free. Free from worry. Free from anxiety. Do it for your children, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down now. We're back to Matthew chapter 6. You open your Bible with me as we look at Matthew chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 25. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. Not yet for your body what ye shall put on. It's not the life more than the meat. And the body more than raiment. As you look at that verse of scripture. And you see the very heart of what the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching. And what he always also demonstrated in his life. He taught it and he lived it out. A life without worry. A life without anxiety. A life without fear. A life without panic. You'll see that he touched on different things there. But the central truth and the central thought is take no thought. We have gone over that. Now you understand that means don't be extra careful and don't be worried and don't be anxious. Then he mentions serious of life that people are worried about. Number one, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we eat? He says, don't worry about that. The world is now more than about 6,000 years old. And the people following after the Lord from the time of Adam and Eve. Until the time of Abel and the time of no, uh, the time of Enos and the time of and the time of Noah and the time of Enoch, all those people they lived through this life and they have been fed. And if he fed all of them and he fed Eve and he's feeding even the birds and the beasts of the of the field, he said, "Take no thought, be not anxious." He fed all those other people. He will feed you. Remember the children of Israel in the wilderness; they had nothing. And yet, for those 40 years, those millions of people, without sowing or reaping, gathering into a barn, yet God fed them. And Jesus said, take no thought. What shall we eat? Number two, he said, what shall we drink? You must remember the history of the people of God. They came out of Egypt. In fact, when they were in Egypt, do you remember there was a time when Moses performed a miracle? It was a miracle of judgment. And all their water became blood. And yet the children of Israel in Goshen, they had something to drink. It always makes a difference between the people of God and the people of the world. And then they were in the wilderness. There was the rock before them. And the rock that followed them was Christ. And then they said, what are we going to drink? And then God said, Moses, what's that in your hand? It's a rod. Strike the rock. And water came out. Have you forgotten that God says, I'm God. I change not. Don't care then. And don't worry. Don't be anxious. What shall we drink? He'll provide what you will drink. And then it says, what shall we put on? What shall we put on? That's the third thing. The third area. That's actually what we're looking at today. Look at verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not. Neither do they reap. Nor gather into bands. Yet your heavenly father feedeth them. I just want you to see how logical the Lord Jesus Christ is. First of all, he said, don't worry. What shall we eat? And now he says, your heavenly father feedeth them one, one. And then he goes to point two. He says, don't worry. What, what are we going to drink? 
And then he goes on, he says, even if you think about that, will that add any cubit, any measure, any quality to your life? He says, no. Now he comes to the area of our clothing. And then he says in verse 28, and why take ye thought for image, for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, was not closed like one of these. Wherefore, it says, put on your thinking cap. It says, think very well. It says, let there be logic in your thinking. What kind of logic? It says, therefore, wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more close you, O ye of little faith? He's telling us, if we ever get worried at all, it's because we have little faith. If we ever get bothered and concerned at all, to the point we give ourselves hypertension, it's because we have little faith. It says, if God so close, those insignificant uh, creatures, creation of God, the grass of the field and the lilies in the valley, if God so close them, will he not much more close you? You that you are the peak of creation, the crown of creation, the most beautiful and needed, the most worthy in creation, shall he not much more close you? Oh, ye of little faith, it's a lack of faith. Our little faith, that is the main cause for our worry and for anxiety. Our failure to consider the acts of God is care of the creatures of time. The things that exist today and tomorrow they are forgotten. And it's, it's that lack of consideration that makes us to worry and to get anxious. We are both earthly dignity and eternal destiny. We have an existence beyond this life. Which the lilies of the field do not have. And the Lord is saying, if the Lord God Almighty, the God of heaven and earth, will be so concerned about the little, literally significant things, will he not be concerned for you, you who have as dignity as well as eternal destiny? Each time our Lord rebukes the disciples for their lack of faith, or for the little faith, it was because they refused to consider and to think logically. Let me show you what I mean. In Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, every time he rebuked them. And every time he rebukes us for littleness of faith or for lack of faith. It's because we refuse to think logically. And we refuse to consider things that are very, very obvious. Look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 verse 35. And the same day when the evening was come, he says unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. Oh, that's very simple. Let's pass over unto the other side. What do we learn from there? The Lord, of course, said, we're leaving point A. We're getting to point B. And he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Anything may happen between point A and point B. Let's pass over. We're going to point B. The storm may arise and the wind may blow between point A and point B. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. We're getting to point B. Be. He had said, let us pass over unto the other side. Look at verse 36. And when they had sent away the, the, the multitude, they took him even as he was in the sheep. And there were also with him other little sheep. And there arose a great storm of wind. That matters not. There arose a great storm of wind. Don't look at that. Always remember, let us pass over onto the other side. It's because we don't consider the words he had said. And we do not understand. Even though heaven will pass away the skies and the whole earth, what is said, let's pass over to the other side, cannot go unfulfilled. What's the storm? What's the wind? What are the waves? 
All those things matters not. They matter not. When the Lord said, let us pass over onto the other side. And then it says, in, the, in that verse 37 now, and the waves beat into the sheep. That doesn't matter. So that it was not full. That means nothing. And it was in the hinder part of the sheep. Asleep on a pillow, obviously. He wasn't worried. He wasn't anxious. He wasn't panicking. He wasn't afraid. He had said, let us go over to the other side. He knew that he still had a ministry to fulfill. The waves and the storm. They will obey the master. And he just, he just went to sleep. And then the other people, they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Have they forgotten? Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Have you done the fishing for men yet? No. Well, that will be fulfilled. You cannot perish. Have you gone to the other side yet? No, not yet. Well, you're going to get to the other side. I said you'll get to the other side. Why worry about all these little, little, little things? A storm on the sea. A storm in the family. A storm in a pathway. When the Lord Jesus had said, let us pass over onto the other side. Think of what he said. Don't think on the storm. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? Why are you so worried? Why are you so anxious? How is it you have no faith? Where is your faith? Didn't you hear? Let us pass over to the other side, chapter 5, verse 1. And he came over unto the other side. We will get over to the other side. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. You know when you are worried, it's because there's something you have forgotten. You have forgotten the word of God. You're looking around. You're looking at people. You're looking at the enemy. You're looking at the storm. You're looking at the waves. You're looking at your body. You're looking at your circumstances. That's why you are worried. Look at the word. Matthew chapter 14. And I'm reading from verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. He didn't multiply words. If it be thou, bid me come unto thee. And he said, come. What's the meaning of that? That means it's Christ. Because Peter said, I will know by only one word that that's Christ in front of me. That word is just come. Just tell me to come and I'll know it's you. And just said, yes, it's me. Come. On the basis of that word, in verse 29, and when Peter was come down out of the sheep, he walked on the water to go unto Jesus. And he was told in verse 30, and when he saw the wind, boisterous, he was afraid. Why look at the wind when you can look at Jesus? You have a choice. You have a choice. You can look at Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author, and the finisher of our face. You can keep on looking unto Jesus. Why look at the wind? There are many, always many things to look at. Always many things to look at. Look at the right person. Look at Christ. Why look at your enemy? Why think about their words? When we have the word of Christ to think about, and it says, come. And when you saw the wind, boisterous, they were told they became afraid. And they were told, beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. He began to sink. He began to sink. Take that word, sink. Our feeling. You have a sinking feeling. That's depression. Anytime you have sinking feeling, as if you are sinking, you're no more on the level. You cannot walk straight. You have depression. You have despair. You have panic. You have fear. You have been looking at the wrong thing. You've heard some information. You've seen some sight. You have watched something. And that thing is bringing panic and fear, depression in your heart. That sinking feeling is because you're looking at the wrong thing. 
Look at Jesus and all the sinking feeling will vanish away. He cried and said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. We have little faith when we're looking at the wrong thing. You know, Satan would like you, he likes you to look at his picture. Satan has a lot of pictures. He likes you to look at his film. He likes you to look at his drama. And he shows a lot of that drama in the dream. And you say, look at this. Then you wake up and the picture is still very fresh and clear in your mind. You're looking at the wrong thing. And then you cannot sing amazing grace or good the sound. Because you've been looking at the wrong thing. The devil will show you a lot of pictures. Give you a lot of news. And when you're looking at that, you have that sinking feeling in your heart. You'll bow your head and your shoulders will drop. You'll not be able to walk like a man, like a Christian. Quit you like men and stand in faith, looking unto Jesus and all the fears and all the worry, all the anxiety, everything will vanish away. You are going to overcome. But you see, it is when we're looking at the wrong thing, then we begin to have that kind of feeling. That's why we know that the cause of worry, the cause of anxiety is the littleness of faith. The reason for that littleness of faith is the absence of the proper consideration or logical thinking on what the Lord had said. If God has done the seemingly insignificant thing, will he not do the supremely important thing? If God cares for creatures of no value, will he not care for new creatures of eternal value? If God protects and provides for unclean creatures, he says they're even unclean. And the children of Israel should not eat them. How much more will he care for new creatures, cleansed creatures, creatures that have been prepared for heaven? Look at Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, you see what Jesus was teaching them. I'm just saying, think. If you think right, your thoughts will give you good feeling. Good thoughts lead to good feeling. And the good feeling and the good thoughts interacting together will set you free from the worry and the anxiety. Luke chapter 12, verse 24. Consider the ravens. Now telling the children of Israel, consider the ravens, that was a great revelation because they knew something about the ravens. I'll show you now. Consider, he said, the ravens. What, what made the ravens uh, different from all the others? Number one, it was so small, insignificant. Not only that, it was unclean to them. They shouldn't even eat it. Consider the ravens. For neither, for they neither sow nor reap. Which neither have storehouse nor bank. I need to interpret that to you. It says they don't have any bank account. They do not have any reserve. And they do not have any income. What? Ravens? They neither sow nor reap. They are jobless. They don't have any bank account. They don't have any regular income, which neither have storehouse nor barn. And God feedeth them. If I'm out of job, will I die of hunger? Tell me out loud. No. If I don't have any bank account, I'm a child of God. Do you think I'm going to die of hunger? No. But that's why we're worried. That's why we're anxious. And the Lord is saying, I'll take care of you. You will not worry. You will not be anxious. And the Lord will take care of our lives in Jesus' name. And in that verse 24, it says, God feeded them. How much more? Are ye better than the fowls? Let's look at those ravens in Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 14. And every raven after his kind. Jump down to verse 19. And every creeping thing that flies is unclean unto you. The ravens were counted and grouped with the unclean birds that they shouldn't eat. And yet God was feeding those ravens. In Job chapter 38 
verse 41. Job chapter 38, verse 41. Who provided for the raven his food? When his young ones cry unto God, they wonder for lack of meat. Psalm 147, verse 9. 147 verse 9 he gave he gave it to the beast his food and to the younger ravens which cry you will see then what the lord was telling the people he was telling them and he's telling and he's telling us too that there is nothing to worry about he'll provide for you he will protect you. Consider the acts of God and think logically on the actions and the kindness of God. Then you will have faith in God and faith will banish fear, will cancel worry, will erase anxiety from your life. What well, we're looking at the study tonight in three points. Number one, unnecessary anxiety of sons with little faith. Unnecessary anxiety of sons with little faith. Number two, unnoticed apparel of Solomon and the lily's frailty. Unnoticed apparel of Solomon and the lily's frailty. Number three, unfailing assurance of saints with lively faith. The unfailing assurance of saints with lively faith. Let's come to number one, unnecessary anxiety. Every time there's anxiety in your life, that's unnecessary. That's unnecessary. Throw it away. It's a luxury you cannot afford to have. Unnecessary anxiety of sons with little faith. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 6 and looking at verse 28. Matthew chapter 6 verse 28. And why take his thought for image? Why take his thought for image? When Jesus said why? He was demanding an answer. He was asking a question. Every time you see why, you are worried, you are anxious. And I say, why are you worried? Give me an answer. You are fearful. And I am saying, why are you fearful? Give me an answer. You know, when I tell you to give me an answer, I will begin to think. Because you need to think out an answer. And then when you think about it, and then you say, why am I worried? It's because my child is sick. Why are you worried because your child is sick? Because God cannot heal, then you see that worry is unnecessary. Why are you worried? I've taken an exam. I've not seen the result. Can't God guide the people who are marking those papers? Oh, I didn't think about that. Because you didn't think logically, that's why you are worried. Why are you worried? Why are you anxious? Why? And you must answer that question, why? In fact, you must ask yourself, it's very good. Uh, let's say, for example, something happens. Then you begin to worry, you're panicking, you're fearful, and you begin to switch. Just wait and ask, why? Why am I worried? Analyze the situation. Look at the situation itself. Don't, now, I told you not to look at the enemy, but now look at the enemy now and ask yourself, why am I worried for this thing here? How strong is he? How big is he? How serious is his threat? And what harm can what he is doing, what harm can he do to me? Why? Ask yourself the question, why? When something happens, don't just get, don't just fly away in, in rage or in fear or in panic or in anxiety. Ask why. Jesus said, why? Why take key thought? You must answer the question. It is when you analyze everything, you say, okay, why? Anna, why are you crying? Stop crying and analyze your cry. Why are you crying? God gave the children to Rebecca and to Rachel. Why are you crying? Gave child, gave child to Sarah. Why? Analyze the worry. Here we are. And they say that Ahab is running after you. It's going to kill you. Don't, don't worry yet. Ask why. If I'm going to worry about Jezebel or Ahab, why? Who is greater, my God or Jezebel? God. You must analyze the problem. If you don't analyze it and ask the question why, you'll just be, you know, you'll all be, you'll be torn in pieces. 
Now, did you hear Nebuchadnezzar is trying to heat his fire seven times hotter, and then some fear wants to come to you, wants to come to your heart. Don't fear yet, don't worry yet. Ask yourself, why? Why will I worry? If God said, when you pass through the river, I will be with you. When you pass through the fire, I will be with you. Ask the question, why? Now they said, if anybody prays to any God, all these 30 days, he'll be thrown into the lion's den. And then I begin to worry. Before you worry, ask yourself question, why? Why are you worried? The same God who delivered Daniel out of the lion's den, is your God dead? Can he not do the same thing he did in years gone by? And because he can do the same thing, you ask the question, why? And then all your worry will dissolve. I'm going to show you now. You must always ask the question, why? Why? Something happens, you're worried, you're anxious, you wake up at night suddenly and fear strikes your heart. Don't respond to that fear yet. Just ask your question, yourself, why? I don't even know what has happened. I'm now afraid. Why? Is my God asleep? Why am I worried? Is Jesus no more by the right hand of the Almighty God? Why am I worried? Don't have the promises of God. Why am I worried? Is he, is he not taking care and watching over his own? Why am I worried? Why? We're looking at uh, Psalm 40, Psalm 42. In Psalm 42, I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 42 verse 5, it says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Ask your soul the question. Why are you cast down? Why are you bothered? Why are you fearful? Why are you worried? It says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. There's still a God on the throne. Because of that, that answers your question as to why. Look at verse 11. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Isaiah chapter 40. Ask yourself the question, why? Next time, when something strikes. Next time, when fear comes to your heart. Next time, when worry and anxiety wants to grip you and tear your life apart, don't worry yet. Ask yourself the question, why? Why are you worried about that? I had news. Yes, what kind of news is that? Then you tell me, and you say, why does that news worry you? Analyze the news. And present that letter, that information before the Almighty God and see what you will do about it. Why? Why are you worried? I said chapter 40 verse 27. Why sayest thou, O Jacob? Why speakest thou, O Israel? My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known? Now, he's trying to analyze Jacob's worry and Jacob's anxiety. Why, Jacob, are you worried? Why, Israel, are you fearful? Have you not heard? Have you not known? Has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. If you read verse 28 as an answer to verse 27, as the answer to the why, your worry will dissolve away. Your anxiety will clear away like the cloud before the wind. In verse 29, he giveth power to the faith. And to them that have no might, increase strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 8 I'm looking at verse 26 Matthew chapter 8 verse 26 It tells It says but And which Matthew Chapter 8 We're looking at Verse 26 And it says unto them Why are ye fearful O ye of little faith 
Why are you fearful? Why don't you think? Uh, don't, don't be afraid yet. Just open your eyes and look in front of you. Who do you see? I see Christ. As you see Christ, what do you think about? I think of his power to open the eyes of the blind. I see his power to even raise the dead. Even if the sea will swallow us up, and drown us and then we float and we all float to the shore and we're all dead look at jesus here the dead disciples in the sight of jesus christ it will raise us up so why are you afraid because of the storm because of the sea but look at jesus that's why he said you see me in front of you and you're still afraid why are you fearful always ask the question why and you solve the problem in matthew chapter 16 i'm looking at verse 8 matthew chapter 16 we're looking at verse 8 we're following through on this question why matthew chapter 16 verse 8 it tells us here it says which when jesus perceived he said unto them O ye of little faith why reason ye among yourselves because we have we have brought no bread why reason ye within yourselves among yourselves because we have brought no bread it says you must reason and you ask yourself, why? Why do you reason the way you reason? It tells us something. It's our reasonings that give us anxiety. It's not what happens. You know, storm is a kind of blowing. The storm doesn't make me worried. It is my thought, my reasoning about the wind that gets me worried. I'm having some heat or some temperature fever on my body and then i got worried it's not the fever that gets me worried it's my reasoning my thinking on the war on the fever that gets me worried i hear the information that my enemy is planning something he wants to do something and that thing he wants to do i hear about it it gets me worried it is not what he tries to do that gets me worried it is my reasoning my thinking about what i think he wants to do that gets me worried that's why jesus said why do you reason in your heart this and this just change your thinking and change your reasoning about the situation and then all the worry and all the anxiety everything will flee away you're not worried anymore i said you are not worried anymore why should you be worried when jesus christ is still on the throne we're looking at luke chapter 24 verse 38 luke chapter 24 i'm reading verse 38 why why luke chapter 24 verse 38 and he said unto them why are you troubled why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Uh, the Lord is telling us the very root of worry and anxiety is the thought we have. He says, why do thoughts arise? Those thoughts were not there before, but now the thoughts arise in your heart. It is when those wrong thoughts, negative thoughts, and negative conclusions, when they arise in your heart, that's why you get worried. Actually, the story here is Jesus died three days before. Now he rose again. And Jesus, when he rose again, he was right in their presence. And he joined them as they were talking together. And they didn't know it was Jesus. They were thinking about Jesus. They thought he was still in the grave. And he was alive right in the midst of them. And then as was in the midst of them now, thoughts were rising up in their heart. And Jesus said, you see your problem? You are worried because you think I'm still in the grave. I've risen from the dead. Here I am. Why do thoughts arise in your heart? Why? You know, if you ask yourself the question, why all does all this worry, all this anxiety, everything will flee away? The only question is, why? And we're looking at John chapter John chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 15. John chapter 20. We're looking at verse 15. And Jesus says unto a woman, Why weepest thou? 
woman, why we pass down? Why don't you analyze your tears? Analyze, do some examination, do some evaluation of your tears. Why do we just cry without analyzing it? Why am I crying? What's bothering me? What's my problem? I live almost in paradise and I don't know it. I live in the midst of joy. I don't know it. I live in the midst of revival and resurrection. And I don't know it. I have Jesus Christ, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. I have him living inside my heart. And I'm still worried and anxious. And the Lord is asking me why. And the Lord is asking me the same question, why. He says, woman. My dear sister tonight, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She's supposing, supposing, that's why we're worried. That's why we're worried. Something happens. I suppose. I put my own interpretation on that thing that happens. And because of that supposition, because of my own kind of him imposing my meaning on that thing that happened, I get myself worried. Ah, now I understand. Were the people killing ourselves? Were the people tormenting ourselves? The things that happen are neutral. The things that happen, they have no meaning except the meaning you give them. And because of your supposition, this has happened. And then because that thing has happened, your brain begins to generate ideas as to why that thing happened. And you suppose this and suppose this. And your supposition causes you suffering. That's why we suffer. That's why Jesus said, woman, why weepest thou? And she supposing him to be the gardener, says unto him, sir, if thou have born him hence. He's talking to Jesus and he's looking at Jesus as a gardener. And he said, if you have taken my Jesus away from here, tell me where thou hast led him. And I will take him away. And Jesus says unto her, Mary call her name and that voice opened her heart she recognized the voice and she she turned herself and said unto him rabboni which is to say master any tears anymore any worry anymore when your thought is set right the worry will go when the supposition now she knew it is not the gardener it's jesus that i'm looking for he's risen from the dead the moment the truth comes to you the moment the truth becomes revealed to you all the worry all the anxiety will be gone that's the reason why anytime worry comes anytime anxiety comes the first question to ask yourself is why why am i worried analyze everything and then the truth will come to you and that truth will wipe away all your worry and all your anxiety let's come back to matthew chapter 6 we're looking at verse 28 matthew chapter 6 verse 28 now you understand you must always ask yourself the question why why in verse 28 and why take his thought for image Consider the lilies of the, of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. In Vastachi, wherefore, if God so close, the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more close you, O ye of little faith? And Lord asks the question, why are you worried and anxious for clothing? Is not the body more than the raiment? If God has given our body, uh, has given us our body, and is feeding that body, keeping it in good health, will He not also close the body? If He has appointed our diet and the responsibility which can only be done in a body that is properly, appropriately clothed and dressed, will He not provide adequate and appropriate clothes or clothing for us? Yes, he will, because he has done that before. And when you think about what God has done before and what God is still willing to do today, all the fear, all the panic, all the anxiety, all the worry, everything will vanish away. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'm reading verses 3 and 4. 
Deuteronomy chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8, we're looking at verses 3 and 4. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy father know that she might make thee to know that man does not lay by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God does man live. At thy raiment wax not old upon thee Neither did thy foot swell these forty years He said he closed you and your raiment did not wax old And the Lord is reminding us that if Almighty God did that for those uh, Israelites He will do it for us By the way, by the way, dressing is not uh, the end of life And dressing is not the purpose of life Dressing is a means to an end By the way, eating is not the end of life Eating is for a particular purpose And you know many people, they forget the purpose of living And the purpose of life, the purpose of existence And then the thing that is just to help us to move on to the purpose That's what they concentrate on why do I have to eat so I can be strong? Why do I want to be strong so I can walk? Why do I want to walk to do what the Lord has appointed for me to do? That's why. The eating is good, but the eating is not the end of life. You know, some people, they only think about, I need to eat, I need to eat, I need to eat. Why do you eat? Don't make the eating the final thing, the greatest thing. Uh, see if that eating is the, is the thing you're living for You eat so to fulfill the purpose of life Why do we dress? You know some people make dressing The goal of life The purpose of life uh, the, the, the peak of life As if that is the greatest thing We dress so as to do To fulfill Have you noticed? If you have nowhere to go You don't dress you know, you are in your house, there is nothing to do, there's nowhere to go, and there's no purpose to fulfill, and there's no, there's no school to go and teach in. You are just inside your room, there is nothing to do. You don't care to dress. Why do you dress? Because there is a goal, because there's a purpose, because you want to go somewhere. If you have nowhere going, there is no need to dress. Stay inside your room. Therefore, we understand we shouldn't be worried about dressing as if dressing is the only thing to do in life. That's what Jesus is saying. Dressing is not an end by itself. It is to close us so we can fulfill the purpose of God for living. God has ordained that purpose for living. The purpose of each life on earth is important to God. That purpose must be central in our concern. It is that central purpose we have to be concerned about. Why am I created? Why am I living on earth? Why am I educated? Why am I a Christian? Why am I a preacher? Why am I a worker in the church? Why am I going to my place of work? The why? The why for living? And the purpose for living. That's the important thing. Now I must close myself appropriate for my job. Appropriate for my purpose for living. Appropriate for my purpose for existence. That's what the Lord is saying. And let's look at this. You must define the purpose while you are here. And then you dress appropriately to fulfill that purpose. We're looking at Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26 verse 16. Acts 26 verse 16 But rise and stand upon thy feet For I have appeared unto thee For this purpose That's it I have appeared unto thee for this purpose Determine the purpose While you are alive And if you determine the purpose is Then you consider what kind of dressing Do I wear to fulfill The purpose for which I live not the dressing. It's not the dressing first. It's the purpose of living first. And then in that verse 16 it says, I've appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of the things which thou hast seen and of those things of the, in the which I will appear unto thee. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 10. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, faith, 
long suffering, charity, patience. It says, Timothy, thou hast known my purpose. The purpose of existence, determine that first. It's then dressing will become meaningful. If uh, there's no purpose, you just dress. Where are you going? I'm going nowhere. What are you doing? I'm doing nothing. Then dressing becomes meaningless. Point number two. In point number two, we're looking at unnoticed apparel of Solomon and the lily's frailty. We're coming back to Matthew chapter, we're coming back to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 28 all through to verse 30. Matthew chapter 6, we're looking at verse 28. And why take his thought for image? Why take his thought for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that Solomon, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Even Solomon was not arrayed like one of these. Let, let me ask you the question. When you think about Solomon, do you think of his wisdom or of his clothing? Again, wisdom. We don't think about the dressing. The dressing that he had was to make him come out so that those women, whenever they, when they had their challenge, one child is died, the other one is alive, so they could come to him and then ask the question, it's not his dressing that matters, it's his wisdom. And that's what we know him for. Even the examples that Jesus gave later, and he said, uh, the, the queen of Sheba will condemn this generation because she came from a far country to come and see the dressing of Solomon. What? The wisdom. The wisdom. That's the purpose of life. That's the purpose of life. To come and see the wisdom of Solomon. The dressing is just to make you to be able to come out to demonstrate your gift. To use your talent. To fulfill your purpose. The dressing is not the end of life. It's the wisdom. When you think about David, do we think about his courage or his clothing before Goliath? What do we think about? His courage. Not the dress. Of course, he was dressed. He was dressed. But his dressing was not the overall thing. You're thinking about Moses before Pharaoh. Are we thinking about his power or his clothing? His power. It's, that's what matters. And that's what made him to fulfill Dressing alone will not make us fulfill the purpose of life. You have to get the wisdom. You have to get the power. Look at our children, our young people. When we see them, they've written their examination. They come out. And what are we interested in? We're interested in their knowledge, not in their dressing. If any of our children were just, you know, dressed so nicely and all that, and just be, you know, moving about, we we'll say, well, dressing apart. What kind of grade did you have? Did you make it in English or mathematics or chemistry or science or literature? We want to know about their knowledge. That's what makes up life. Dressing does not make up life. Therefore, instead of wor getting worried and worried and worried and anxious about dressing, what's the purpose of life? I'm looking at Elijah. I'm looking at Elisha. What matters to me about Elijah, about Elisha, is it their authority, spiritual authority before Ahab or it is the addressing which matters spiritual authority when 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 elijah came to ahab and i said according to my word there shall be no dew nor rain all these years according to my word i don't care about his dressing i am not even why i don't i'm not even asking whether he's wearing something long or something short I, I'm, I'm impressed about his spiritual authority what people look at in our lives is not the dressing, it's the authority you carry, the power that you carry. I'm looking at Daniel now as, you know, he went to pray and then those enemies, they caught him. They said, we've seen him and then they're matching him to the lion's den. And I see the man and, you know, he's confident, he's bold, he's courageous, he's just walking with shoulders square and then he's, you know, he pulls himself to the tallest height and he matches the lion's den. They put him there. What am I? What am I wondering about? Is dressing or his face? His face. 
That's what matters. And when you seek about life, dressing is not, it's not the all in all. You know, there are people that everything is dressing, dressing, dressing. Who cares about dressing? Let me see your face and your boldness and your courage and your spiritual authority. I'm looking at Peter and John and they're going to the temple at the hour of prayer. And they saw this man at the, at the gate beautiful. He was lame from his mother's womb. And then I hear Peter saying, look on us. Silver and gold have I none. What I have I give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And I say, I want to copy Peter. Am I copying his power or his dressing? His power. The dressing is not the important thing. What are we looking at is the power that he manifested. The miracle was able to perform. And I look at Paul the apostle and I see the depth of knowledge that he had. As he wrote the epistle to the Romans and Galatians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, just keeps on writing, keeps on preaching, keeps on traveling, keeps on doing this. And then what am I thinking about? Am I thinking about the spiritual knowledge of Paul or his dressing? What am I thinking about? spiritual knowledge what i'm saying is you have a reason for to live moses had a reason to live and then the dressing was just by the way to prepare him and help him to fulfill that purpose you'll fulfill the purpose of your life yeah. dressing is not dressing is not you know everything in life you know some people they don't worry about knowledge about miracle about faith about power about spiritual authority or about courage or about wisdom all they're thinking about is dressing the lord is saying the dressing is not the all in all Think about another scene and see how you are going to live in life. God will give you the wisdom. Everything we need to be able to do what we need, he'll give it unto us in Jesus' name. And then the Lord, he will clothe us. But when he clothes us, he's not going to give us strange clothing. Strange clothing. Let's look at Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 8. Zephaniah chapter 1. We're looking at verse 8. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are closed with strange apparel. Strange apparel. You know, God will clothe us, but he'll not, he'll not give us strange apparel. You know, there are some people that will say, God has provided for me. And then we say, what has God provided? He said, look at the clothing God has provided for me. I said, let's leave that apart first. God will feed you. Will he give you something, an unclean, unhygienic, poisonous food to eat? No. If God is going to provide food for you, he'll provide food that will nourish your body. Normal food, clean food. Not food sacrificed unto idols. And also if God is going to heal us He's not going to use traditional medicine Or satanic power of darkness to heal us He's going to use his power clean and pure So that he heals us The same thing If God as God provides for us Clothing is going to provide clean clothing Normal clothing Righteous clothing A kind of clothing that will know it is God That provided this one We know that this one is not satanic This one, it is God that provided this And if it is strange, it's not God If it's worldly, it's not God In First Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9 First Timothy chapter 2 verse 9 in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. When God provides, he doesn't provide something worldly, something, uh, something sensual, some, something demonic, something diabolic. No, he provides something that is reasonable, something that is good, something that is becoming. Something that feeds a child of God. In like manner also that women are done themselves in modest apparel. With shamefacedness and sobriety. Not with broided hair of gold or pearls or costly array. And that's how God provides. God will provide for you. He will meet all our needs. And those needs that he meets will make us to be serving him in the beauty of holiness. In First Chronicles chapter 16 verse 29. First Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 16. We're looking at verse 29. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. 
bring an offering. Come before him. Worship the Lord. How? In the beauty of holiness. When God provides uh, clothes for you and he will provide, you'll serve the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We come to point number three. Point number three of feeling assurance of saints with lively faith. Of feeling assurance of saints with lively faith. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. Wherefore, if God so close the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more close you, O ye of little faith? Shall he not much more close you? God will provide for us. You see, little faith creates anxiety. But lively faith conquers anxiety. Little faith breeds worry. But lively faith banishes worry. Little faith produces fear. Lively faith prevents fear. Little faith makes us panic. Lively faith makes us peaceful. Little faith fills us with care. But lively faith fills us with calm. Little faith brings anxiety and vexation of spirit. But lively faith banishes all that and then brings assurance and victory in our soul. The Lord has said he will take care of us. He will take care of us. You will not die of hunger. He will provide all the jobs you need for you. All your needs will supply according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He has given us promises and those promises will never fail. You are a child of God. You will enjoy your life in Christ. In Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44. We're reading verse 21. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 21. He's telling you that he will never forget you. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel. For thou art my servant, I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. Give me a good amen. amen. Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah 49. We're looking at verses 15 and 16. 49 verses 15 and 16. Can a woman forget a sucking child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb, yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. The Lord says he will not forget you. Anytime the devil tries to make you fearful, remember God will not forget you. It tells us in Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, still reminding us that we're precious in the sight of the Lord. And because we're so precious in his sight, he will always remember us. In Luke chapter 12, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 6, it says, And not two sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God. Insignificant sparrows. Almost worthless, useless sparrows. And yet it says, God does not forget even one of them. But even the very ears of your head are all numbered. All numbered. All numbered. Well, if the ears of your head are all numbered, your toes are all numbered. Your fingers are all numbered. Every part of your body, they are all numbered. If anything is wrong with them, it will recreate them. Because it says, the very ears of your head, they are numbered. It says, fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Psalm 37. In Psalm 37, we're looking at verse 3. Psalm 37, verse 3. Look at the assurance that the children of God have. The assurance that you already have. And you ought to demonstrate that every time. In Psalm 37, verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. And so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Between now and next week, I'll see you again. God will feed you. He'll provide to meet all your needs. 
Hey, you know, sometimes uh, when you're leaving your friend, you say, well, bye-bye for now. I don't know whether you'll see me next week or not because, you know, somebody is threatening me. I don't know what they're going to do. Don't worry about that. There's nothing to worry about. I will see you next week. Because between now and then, God will be watching over you. Thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth that righteousness as the light. And thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. And wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for the evil doers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, they shall dignity uh, consider his place. Thou shalt dignity consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth. And shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Verse 16. In verse 16 it says, A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken. But the Lord upholdeth the righteous. In verse 18. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright. And their inheritance shall be forever. Verse 19. They shall not be ashamed. In the evil time you will not be ashamed. In the days of farming they shall be satisfied. Verse 25. I have been young. Now I am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaking. Nor a seed begging bread. You will not be a beggar. Psalm 84. In Psalm 84, we're looking at verse 11. 84 verse 11. For the Lord God is a son and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good sin will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Are you there? Yeah. Nothing good will escape you. Because you are walking uprightly, you are a child of God. You love the Lord. You love the word of the Lord. Mark it down. Every good thing you need in your life will come your way. Yeah. We're told in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 6 and verse 19. Philippians chapter 4. Reading from verse 6. Be careful for nothing. Be worried about nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And start thanking the Lord because your way is clear already. The provision is given already. It says, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Why don't you say, my God shall supply all my need. All my needs. All my needs. According to his riches in glory. By Christ Jesus. Is there anything to worry about? It's nothing to worry about. God has supplied those needs already. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 32. For after all these things that the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. They are added already. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Your life is blessed by the Lord. Because all these things are added to you already. Yes, you are blessed. There's nothing to worry about. It's providing for you. It's taking care of you. It'll take care of you. No anxiety and no worry. Every time anxiety comes, ask yourself, why? Why am I worried? Why am I worried? My father is taking care of me. Why am I worried? All my needs shall be supplied. Why am I worried? God is still on the throne. Why am I worried? I'm a child of God. Why am I worried? I have a purpose for living. And that purpose will be fulfilled. Why will you ever be worried? The, the, the ears of your head, they are all numbered. Why will you ever be worried in your life? You are precious in the sight of the Lord. He has created you for a purpose. And that purpose is going to be fulfilled. Why will you ever worry in your life let there be peace in your heart
calmness in your soul assurance in your heart the peace that passes understanding you are a child of God he is, he is caring for you he knows you he loves you he will never forsake you wipe the tears away why will you cry why will you panic why will you be afraid? Why will you be worried and anxious? You are a child of God. Rest in the bosom of the Lord. Jesus died because of you. And Jesus rose again because of you. And Jesus stretches out his arms. And he receives you. He says you are my child. The whole of heaven is looking at you. And the angels are wondering about the great inexhaustible love of God on your behalf. Why will you ever be worried? Those thoughts that worry you, banish them. Those thoughts that make you feel and sure and afraid panicking forget them you're a child of god he'll take care of you no you won't die if you're sick you're healed already if your need is supplying your needs already you will not be a beggar don't be afraid about that. You will not be a beggar. Don't be afraid of that. If he has to send ravens to feed you, he will do it. If he has to send strangers to come and give you money, he will do it. If he has to break the windows of heaven open to pour down the rain and the food and the money, he will do it. If he has to multiply the cruise of oil you have in the house, he will do it. If he has to strike the rock and bring out water, he will do it. There's nothing to worry about. He'll take care of you. He will take care of you. Rest in the bosom of Christ. Rest with the Lord. Nothing good will ever escape you. Your personal life, your family life, your spiritual life, professional life. When the promotion is due, it will come. Don't worry, don't be anxious. It will come. It will come. Everything you deserve, more than you deserve. Even the things you don't deserve, good, good things, they will come. There's nothing to worry about. You're one of his children. He'll not forget you. Trust in the Lord and take heart. Never, never de be despised. Never be sad or despondent. Don't you have faith to believe? Everything you need, grace for the duty before you ask of the Lord, and He'll provide, He'll supply. Analyze your fears. Analyze your worries, your anxiety. Put them into pieces. Put them on the table. Why am I worried? Why am I anxious? Why am I fearful? Why do I panic? Evaluate the strength of the enemy. Compare to the strength of the Almighty God. And throw your fears to the wind. There's nothing to worry about. At the end of the day, you will overcome. At the end of the journey, you will rejoice. Make up your mind. I will always ask myself the question, why? Why? Why should I ever worry? Why should I ever be anxious? Why?
In Jesus' name we pray. Now that amen is very good, but I need an amen for the people out there in Jesus' name. You know, now the devil must be worried about us. The demons must be worried about us now. We have transferred the worry out of this place. We have transferred it to the devil. We have transferred the worry to the enemies. We have transferred the worries to all the powers of darkness. In the church of God, there is no worry. Among the believers, there is no worry. Who is worried now? Who is worried now? You're free. I said you're free. Raise up your hand and rejoice in the freedom. And say, Lord, I thank you. No worry in my heart. No anxiety in my soul. I transfer all the worry to the devil. The devil is worried now because he's going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. I am going to heaven with joy, with peace in my soul. I'm not worried anymore. Between now and heaven, the Lord is going to take care of me. No worry, no anxiety. Why should I ever worry when the Lord is taking care of me? I take all the worry out, all the anxiety out, and I throw it to the person belongs to you because I'm a child of God. No worry, no anxiety, and no panic can no fear in Jesus name we pray yeah. Heavenly Father we thank you because we are your children every brother here every sister here oh Lord I pray any challenge they are going through prove to them that you are still on the throne in Jesus name yeah. whatever the enemy said in the dream whatever the opponent said during the day Prove to your children that you are still God on his throne in Jesus name. Take all worry and anxiety out of their heart. All panic and fear out of their heart. And Lord help us now to know you will never forsake us. You will never leave us. Banish all our worry. Banish all our cares. Banish all our anxiety every need of your people from the smallest to the greatest in the church supply in jesus name those who are sick i pray lord stretch out your healing hand touch them heal them in jesus name whatever the sickness may be you are the creator of the heavens and the earth is anything too hard for you no therefore lord we pray you heal your children even now in jesus name those who have been having blockages before them they want to get married and they say this no that one no and they are worried they are worried that they are anxious now oh lord i pray take all that worry away from them all the anxiety away from them all the roads that are blocked open them in jesus name and those who have been anxious before that am i going to ever get married am i going to ever have children oh lord i pray even uh, very soon give them bone of their bone and flesh of their flesh give them the person you appointed for them in jesus name and then those who are married and they have no children and the enemies are saying where is your god our god is here our god will show up and then he'll give you miracle children oh lord i pray silence their enemies in jesus name miracle children for the barren miracle children for the barren we claim it for every one of them in jesus name lord we pray for everyone the workers the leaders the ministers those who are wondering is my work bearing fruit your work is bearing fruit and i pray lord that everything that your people are doing you bless their ministries in jesus name in our places of work those who, who are qualified for promotion and those who are sitting on their progress i pray oh lord remove the enemy give them their promotion give them their progress that lord as we come back next monday will be coming with testimonies he has done it for me he has done it for me he has done it for me he has buttered my bread and put sugar in my tea he has done it for me confirm it in jesus name we well, thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray Amen. Amen. 
Am I worried? Never. You are not worried anymore. Go home and enjoy your blessing.